Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm excited to be here because we're going to be talking tonight and I think next week about a topic that I just find fascinating, uh, not only just as a teacher of theology, but just as a ordinary layperson and, and uh, internet surfer, which is science and um, faith, faith and uh, science. And to give you the big picture of what we're going to be talking about tonight and, and the next night, you can think about this as a little bit of conversation between Genesis 1 and some recent developments in science. Tonight we're going to be focusing chiefly on cosmology and uh, understandings in uh, contemporary physics and do a little bit of history as well. And next week we're going to uh, look at the development of life. And we're going to uh, look at evolution and talk about Darwin. But we're going to do both of these from the perspective uh, not purely, not or solely, from the point of view of what are the scientists saying, but how do we make sense of this as people of faith? And in doing that, in thinking about science and the Bible together, uh, you, could, you can picture us as, on the one hand, holding the Bible in one hand, and on the other hand, uh, holding the newspaper, or the Scientific American, or nature, in the other hand. And we're reading both, um, and we're understanding both, and we have our minds open to both. And in doing that, we're doing something that Christians have been doing for a very, very long period of time. Exploring what uh, Augustine called the book of nature. At the same time, we explore the book of Scripture. Book of nature and the book of Scripture both come from the same hand. They both reveal the same God. They both speak of the glory of God. Uh, the natural world and the uh, revelation that comes to its center in Jesus Christ are both uh, testimonies that ultimately sync up, that uh, reinforce each other and cast light on each other. And for that reason, Augustine was convinced that we, we, mustn't, um, we mustn't approach the Bible in a spirit that closes itself to the best of what natural investigation into the world can show us. And we mustn't uh, investigate the world in a way that closes our hearts to the revelation of God. We really need both and. This is what John Wesley, or Charles, no, it was John Wesley, said uh, was one of his goals was to unite the pair so long disjoined, knowledge and vital piety. That was Wesley's goal, to bring together the pair so long disjoined, knowledge and vital piety. Uh, the book of nature and the book of scripture. And in the words of John Paul II, uh, the wings of the human spirit are two, faith and reason. And when we're not willing to fly with both faith and reason, uh, then we become, we become, become lame. And, and J John Paul II is really only saying what John Wesley had said a couple of centuries before. And what Augustine had said 1,600 years before that. So just uh, as a to help you all see that I'm not making this up, um, let's take a br brief look at a few things that uh, this is actually Augustine's, one of his commentaries he did for fun in his spare time. He worked for many, many years on a commentary on the book of Genesis. And uh, he was focusing on what he called the literal sense of Genesis. Because for Augustine, as for many of the uh, ancient uh, church fathers, the Bible does not just have one true sense. The Bible has multiple true senses, depending on the spirit in which you read it. You can take it at the surface level, and then you're chiefly going for the literal sense or the historical sense. But the literal sense or historical sense also has additional senses, the moral sense or the spiritual sense as well. Well, this was a, this was a commentary just on the literal sense, but he's constantly wandering off into the other senses as well. But uh, here are some of the things he says towards the end. In matters that are obscure and far beyond our vision, 
even in such as we may find treated in Holy Scripture, different interpretations are sometimes possible without prejudice to the faith we have received. In such a case, we should not rush in headlong and so firmly take our stand on one side that if further progress in the search of truth justly undermines this position, we too fall with it. That would be to battle not for the teaching of Holy Scripture, but for our own, wishing its teaching to conform to ours, whereas we ought to wish ours to conform to that of sacred Scripture. So basically, Augustine says, look, interpret the Bible, but don't hold so fast to your interpretation that you identify your interpretation of the Bible with the Bible's authority. Because then what happens when you discover some new knowledge that puts your interpretation into question, then you assume that because your interpretation's been undermined, the Bible's been undermined. No, your interpretation of the Bible has been checked in one respect or another. And he's just getting warmed up. So, so let's skip down uh, to chapter 19 in the, in the big long paragraph. Now, it is a disgraceful and dangerous thing for an infidel to hear a Christian, presumably giving the meaning of Holy Scripture, talking nonsense on these topics. And we should take all means to prevent such an embarrassing situation. Actually, I, I, I should have read the per previous paragraph because it helps us. Usually, even a non-Christian knows something about the earth, the heavens, and the other elements of this world, about the motion and orbit of the stars, and even their size and relative positions, about the predictable eclipses of the sun and the moon and the cycles of the years and the seasons, about the kinds of animals, shrubs, stones, so forth. And this knowledge he holds to as being certain from reason and experience. And he's giving them a, a lot of credit for the knowledge that exists among non-Christians. Now, it is a disgraceful and dangerous thing for an infidel to hear a Christian, presumably giving the meaning of Holy Scripture, talking nonsense on these topics. And we should take all means to prevent such an embarrassing situation, in which people show up vast ignorance in a Christian and laugh it to scorn. The shame is not so much that an ignorant individual is derided, but the people outside the household of the faith think our sacred writers hold such opinions. And to the great loss of those for whose salvation we toil, the writers of our scripture are criticized and rejected as unlearned men. So he's saying, uh, basically, um, when we speak with people whose business is the investigation of the world of nature, uh, we should be cautious and modest before we purport to go and discourse on these things in a way that brings in the purported authority of the Bible to contradict them. Because it may well be that they're quite well informed. We should take, uh, be, have the modesty to consider, again, whether our interpretation of the Bible is really getting at uh, what the Bible wants to convey to us. So this is just a, a little bit of lesson from an important figure in the past reminding uh, us and as we seek to understand our faith um, to be modest, to be open to the learning of scientists and about, around us about the world, and uh, to um, have the humility to be instructed by others who, who know uh, and investigate things. On the other hand, it works the other way too. And these days, I'm sorry to say, there are people who presume to speak in the name of science and who presume to claim the authority and the mantle of science as though science had now somehow come up with discoveries that determined that faith and belief in God was, from a scientific point of view, nonsense, as though, as though science had made discoveries that led that proved the, uh, the irrationality and the not, uh, of belief in God. Um, we have a number of folks, unfortunately, who are making a lot of money these days writing books. Richard Dawkins uh, is an example. Um, the, eighth, the, uh, the God Delusion is one of his books. Richard Dawkins is a wonderful writer 
and uh, knows a lot about evolutionary biology, but I'm afraid he's, he's not a very good guide when it comes to things of, of theology because Richard Dawkins um, makes the same mistake in reverse. He thinks that because he understands something of the book of nature, that he's able to draw final conclusions about uh, the nature of faith. So what I want to do uh, tonight is um, do a little bit of investigation, do a little bit of exploration about how our understanding of the world has developed over the last um, couple of millennia, really, and bring us uh, up to the present day and to some very exciting developments in cosmology and some of their, their significance. Um, we'll ask along the way, from time to time, what these uh, um, discoveries mean uh, for our faith, and I think we're going to make a very surprising discovery. When we look at things in the big picture, where human knowledge has gone over the last two millennia, what we discover is far from disproving Christian faith or the biblical report, in a very surprising and almost eerie way, a lot of science is unfolding in ways that support, uh, confirm um, basic affirmations of the scripture. Now, I'm not going to say science proves the scripture, but I will say that science is consistent with it and, and supports it. And uh, because that's so surprising in some ways, it's not something that we hear a lot on television, but it's true <laughs> anyway. So let's go back, let's transport ourselves back a couple of millennia to, um, in fact, two and a half millennia, about 400 BC to the time of Aristotle in Athens, about 400 BC, 350 BC. And uh, ask ourselves, how did Aristotle understand where the natural world had come from? Now, Aristotle uh, was uh, an inheritor of traditional Greek myths. But as a student of Plato, Aristotle's aim as a philosopher and a natural scientist, because uh, Aristotle was not only a philosopher, but he was really, in his own day, uh, a natural scientist. He was a botanist. He investigated animals and their structures. He did embryology. Uh, and um, he really created the foundations of our classification system of how we classify things into genus and species. Uh, these, these things come from Aristotle and from his inquiries into the natural world. And he also studied astronomy and uh, the, 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 the orbits of the planets and the stars. And he, was, he would ask questions about where things came from. But he would try to do it in a way that didn't rely on the inherited myths of Greek religion. He would try to do it insofar as he could right by relying on observation, reason, and experience alone. So if you're working on the, those bases alone and you ask where did this phenomenal world come from? Where did the stars come from? Where did this ecosystem that we live in come from? If we've got that, and we've got a few principles of logic, such as nothing comes from nothing. It's kind of just a basic logical principle. Nothing can come from nothing. But the world is here. Then it seemed to Aristotle that the most likely explanation of the world was the world had always been here. The world was eternal. The universe was um, a kind of a steady state system. It had never come into existence. It had never, would never in all likelihood pass out of existence. It simply was. And Aristotle did have an understanding of God within the system, 
But we have to understand that for Aristotle, God is not a, a creator. God is really just the highest principle of um, motion in the world. So we need, uh, we've got a world that exhibits um, life, and what does it depend on? Well, on the seasons, but what generates the seasons? Well, the rotation of the sun and the moon. So uh, this, this life on earth seems to depend on celestial bodies. Well, what is the celestial bodies? What causes them to turn? Well, Aristotle thinks that, that each layer of the, of the orbit of the stars probably depends on a orbit further out. And so he's led to postulate um, a, what he calls an unmoved mover. Somewhere in the skies, that is the ultimate source of motion in the world. And for Aristotle, that's where uh, the, the um, energy comes that keeps the world in motion. It's like a little bit like a mobile or uh, wind that keeps the turbine coming. But God doesn't actually create the world. He simply provides its energy inputs into it. Now, we can give a name to this basic picture. Let's call it a steady-state universe. Steady-state universe is simply the conception that the universe is what it is, always has been, always will be. Steady state. Now, interestingly enough, the idea of a steady state universe was uh, the default way of understanding the world from a scientific and philosophical perspective. From Aristotle until... Guess when? 20th century. When Einstein was born, the steady state model of the universe was the dominant way that scientists assumed the universe. Einstein himself was a firm believer in the steady state. When he was a young man, the steady state universe, uh, vision of the universe had no alternatives to it. When Einstein died, he realized he'd been wrong, and, but so had everybody else, so he didn't feel too bad about it. Um, but uh, that happened just in the course of his, his own lifetime. Well, uh, that's quite an extraordinary transformation. Let's go back to a point, at point halfway between Aristotle and Einstein. Let's take a figure like Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas lives in the 1200s. He lives from 1225 to 1274, lives only 49 years one of the most magnificently productive intellectual lives uh, that anybody's ever uh, enjoyed. 49 years old when he, he passes away. By the way, he, after having written so voluminously, uh, towards the end of his life, he stopped. He didn't actually write, he dictated, and he would wear out six secretaries a day. Um, and uh, they would just come creeping out of the room. <laughs> And, uh, and Thomas would send the next one in, send the next one in. And so he just wrote and wrote and wrote, and it's still read, still marvelous commentaries. He stopped writing towards the end of his life. He had a mystical vision. And what he saw in this vision, he never put into words. It, it confirmed his faith uh, in God, but it led him to think that uh, what he had spent his time writing on had been not as important as he thought he was. It is, it, it's straw. What I wrote was straw. Well, we're still processing the straw. Um, but Thomas Aquinas had on the one hand the book of nature, and on the other hand the book of scripture. Book of nature, Thomas interprets using the best <laughs> science of the day. And the best science of the day, if you live in 1225, is... Aristotle. Aristotle has been translated uh, out of Greek into Arabic and from Arabic into Latin. And now Aristotle's being, being read for the first time in Western culture in the early 1200s. 
And Aristotle is bringing his fascination with the natural world into uh, Paris in the mid-1200s. And Aristotle, people says, well, according to Aristotle, the world has always been here. Steady state universe. Thomas reads Genesis, and Genesis says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So what is Thomas going to do? Thomas says, well, from the point of view of science, it appears as though the most rational explanation based on observation and reason alone is that the world has always been here. However, as a matter of faith, we affirm what can't be proved on the basis of uh, science alone, that God created the world and that there was a time when the world didn't, as we know it, didn't exist. But for Thomas, science didn't support that. He didn't think it strictly contradicted it either, but it, it didn't directly support it. So in effect, Thomas was willing to say, well, on this particular issue, science and, and theology point in two different directions. We take them both seriously, but at the end of the day, uh, we're going to trust scripture for the origin of the world. So uh, move forward back to the 20th century. What is it that begins to happen in the early 20th century that gradually raises questions about the steady state universe? Well, of course, we have marvelous telescopes. We're able to discover that, lo and behold, we discover that this um, solar system is embedded in a larger uh, body that we come to call a galaxy. Well, until fairly recently, we thought this galaxy was the universe. In other words, this, I mean, it's, a big, it's a big place, our galaxy. Well, now we know that it has uh, hundreds of billions of stars. And we thought it coincided, but we began to realize that there were similar bodies outside of our galaxies just as big as this phenomenally big galaxy. But as we began to study and plot these galaxies in space, we, we made a strange discovery. That galaxy up there is getting farther away from us. And that galaxy over there is getting farther away from us. And that galaxy that we're looking at from Australia is getting farther away from us. And lo and behold, they're all getting farther away from us. In fact, they, they all seem to be getting farther away from each other. Well, this is very, very odd. How can everything in a steady state universe be getting farther away? Um, and, and, and specifically, they were able to tell this by um, a redshift in, in the light spectrum. As things move, you know, when an ambulance goes past you, as it approaches, the pitch is higher. And as it passes, as soon as it passes you, the pitch gets lower. In effect, the wavelengths get longer. They stretch as something moves away. Well, what they could tell was that light was on the redshift. It was, the wavelengths were longer because the galaxies were, in fact, moving away. Well, do a thought experiment. Imagine everything moving away from each other. Now roll the film backwards. Everything getting closer to each other. Well, if you keep rolling it backwards, everything was closer. And before that, it was even closer. And even before that, it was closer. And so, finally, somebody had the audacious idea that at one point, all of the matter and the energy in the universe was actually in the same place. That this universe had once occupied a very, very small place. Well, guess who had that idea and proposed it first in the 1920s? It wasn't Einstein. It, 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 he would have certainly been a good guess. It was a Belgian priest, a Jesuit. 
who has uh, both a member of the Order of Jesus and also an astronomer, George Lemaitre. And George Lemaitre published a paper in a Belgian journal in the 1920s proposing the idea that, in fact, all of the universe, far from having been in a steady state, came into existence from what he called a primal egg. Well, if you're going to be a great physicist, don't publish in a Belgian journal. Um, it, he had that great idea. He had other great ideas. He was actually the first to propose uh, the, the Hubble constant and other things that got named after Hubble and things like that. And instead of the Lemaitre constant, it's the Hubble constant. Instead of having a Hubble telescope, we could have a Lemaitre telescope, uh, but it's the Hubble telescope and stuff like that. So anyway, he publishes this paper in a Belgian journal. It does not uh, get a whole lot of attention, but the idea itself won't uh, go away. And um, others begin to propose it. In uh, the 1940s and 50s, uh, the idea is still floated. Um, and it runs into a real buzzsaw of criticism from the most of the cosmological world. And the reason is, in part, um, frankly, because Let's be honest, it's just too much like the book of Genesis. It suggests that in the beginning, there was an act that caused this tremendous world to come into existence. And the fact that it came from a Belgian priest, you know, didn't do it any favors either. Um, so the idea of the world coming from a primal egg really had to fight for life uh, against a great, a great deal of skepticism. Um, in the 1950s, I think it was, George Hoyle, who was a very fine uh, physicist in his own right, was speaking on the BBC. And he was a, a strong proponent of the steady state vision of the universe, which simply said the universe has always been here, always will be. And George Hoyle was kind of putting down the view of Lemaitre and the primal egg, and he characterized that view as just this big bang nonsense. And so it was George Hoyle who gave the name Big Bang to uh, the idea that was originally um, proposed by Lemaitre. Well, in time, uh, and here's, uh, Einstein didn't like it either. Um, my French is very bad, but um, is anybody good, good, got a good French accent? <laughs> I know somebody does. You're not, you're just being modest. Okay, so you got to hear my. Vos calculs sont correct, mais votre physique est abom abominable. Your calculations are correct, but your physics is abominable. <laughs> That's what uh, Einstein had to say about Lemaitre's idea of the primal egg. Um, OK. So what began to shift opinion? How come now we take what nowadays steady state universe is a minority opinion. You have to really be extremely creative to figure out how it ways to defend it. And people take the Big Bang um, uh, as the most plausible hypothesis. And just within the last uh, month, some new um, uh, studies have been published that suggest provide even more, more support. Anyway, what happened in the 1960s is that it became possible to test for um, a uh, feature that we thought should be there if, in fact, the Big Bang had really happened. And what people thought should be there if there really had been a Big Bang was quite simply radiation left over from the Big Bang. You should still be able to see uh, that radiation. And moreover, if there were radiation from a Big Bang, what we should discover about it is that presumably, since everything was in the same place, and uh, presumably this radiation would be everywhere you looked. You, you wouldn't look one place and see it and not another place. You, it would be um, everywhere. 
Well, in the 1960s, finally we began to detect, to detect what is called the cosmic microwave background. And the cosmic microwave background is a very, very tiny bit of energy that is uniformly distributed wherever we look. And it's extremely uniform. It's extremely small, but it's just in the right range where physicists were looking for it as a kind of a thumbprint left over from the Big Bang. And once they discovered that there was this radiation left over, it becomes very convincing. We're beginning to get more and more evidence. Well, now things are really looking because now we can kind of reconstruct a picture of the lifetime of the universe. And it looks as though the sequence is, there is in effect, uh, for all intents and purposes, a singularity, something that is so dense, so high energy that it doesn't, can't even be described in terms of our ordinary experience of the world. And then, and for reasons we do not know or understand, it um, flashed into light. That uh, the very first things that emerge are uh, um, um, subatomic particles, photons, and so forth. And as the uh, light expands, we get gradually a process where um, the uh, for formation of the first uh, atomic nuclei are possible and the first elements. So we get the very simplest uh, elements, um, helium, hydrogen, at the very bottom of the elemental table. And gradually, as the universe expands, we have what comes next. Well, let's see, in Genesis, how does it go? Light, and then, isn't it sun and moon? Well, in fact, what happens is, uh, and we'll talk a little bit, bit, bit more, as the matter expands, there are fi faint little ripples in the distribution of the matter and energy, which causes some of the matter and energy to coalesce. Energy and gravity begins to work, do its magic, pull it together, and you have the creation of the first stars. And so next comes the stars. And the stars go through their lifespan burning hydrogen and helium and the, uh, the elements at the bottom of the elemental table, and then finally they consume all their energy and there's no more to burn and it all implodes under the force of gravity, goes back and then kabam, explodes. And in the tremendous heat of the exploding stars, you get the creation of the higher and more complicated elements on the periodic table and iron and oxygen and gold and silver and all this stuff is exploded out and becomes the matter that gradually is coalesced into the next stage. And so from the process of light to celestial bodies, you gradually have through the lifetime of stars and the production of stardust, the possibility of planets that have multiple kinds of elements in them and that in time produce uh, what we experience as life, beginning with the things that swim in the water and fly in the air and creep upon the ground and uh, things of vegetation. And then finally, in a ge geological blink of an eye, uh, just recent and past, we have human beings. So we go from a steady state universe in Aristotle to a picture of the universe that is uncannily, I'll just speak for myself, you don't have to agree with me, that is uncannily like 
the beginning of Genesis. And that suggests that um, uh, there is uh, something, um, I don't know, the more, the more we get to know the book of nature, the more we have reason to take the book of Scripture seriously. And the more we get to know the book of Scripture, the more it leads us to see the same hand at work in, in the book of nature. So, uh, this is um, surprising enough. And yet, in, since the 1960s, our um, understanding of the cosmic world has continued to develop. And in some ways, the biggest surprises are, are, are even more recent than that. In the last 30 years, things get even more uh, fascinating and interesting. Um, one of the things we discover is how little we truly understand, or to put it a different way, how fantastically mysterious this world is that we live in. Um, and I, I just want to underscore this idea. Part of what science teaches us is that the world, and we, if, we, if we generally approach the world in a scientific um, attitude, uh, teaches us how magnificently mysterious uh, this world is, how much uh, depth of um, uh, magnificence it has. Um, now, I say genuine attitude of science, and I distinguish that from what I, I think w we could call a scientism. Uh, scientism is an attitude that says science has all the answers. It doesn't have all the answers. I mean, science, for example, can't tell us that all people are created equal. Science can't prove to us the intrinsic value of a human life. Um, so science can't uh, prove that there really is such a thing as beauty or goodness. So don't let anybody tell you science has all the answers. Um, science can't speak to a lot of things that are extremely important to a human society. Science can't establish that all, that, uh, um, all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain and inalienable rights. Um, but when we do take science seriously as something that can tell us about the natural world, it speaks to this world as being fantastically beautiful and mysterious in a way that I think does speak to uh, belief in God. For example, now here we're going to go back again to uh, back in history a little bit. Um, Isaac Newton, Christian. Serious student of the Bible, excellent in Greek, Hebrew, uh, um, and of course one of the, the greatest minds of all time. Uh, Newton's theory of gravity, of his understanding of planetary motion, of the nature of uh, how gravity works at distances, bequeathed to Western society and to all humankind a vision of the universe that operated with stunning regularity, a kind of cosmic clockwork in which we understood uh, matter and energy, what we thought, extremely well. Well, that was 300 years ago. What's happened more recently is that the Newtonian view of the universe, we've begun to discover, um, is incomplete that we... Um, to, to describe the world we see, we have to postulate dark energy and dark matter as components of the world. I'll, I'll say more about what that means, but let me just give you an estimate of how much of the universe consists of dark energy and dark matter. And when we say dark energy and dark matter, you know what we're really saying? Haven't got a clue matter haven't got a clue energy. That's what dark energy and dark matter means. 
It literally is energy and matter about which we have no clue. Um, dark energy, dark matter co combined comprise about, it is estimated, 96% of the total energy matter content of the universe. So what we think of as ordinary uh, matter and energy that we can interact with and measure constitutes about 5% of the universe. The rest of it is haven't got a clue energy, haven't got a clue matter. Now we have guesses, we have estimates. Dark, ener dark, uh, dark matter we began to uh, imagine needed to be there starting back in, in the 1950s. What we began to realize as we studied the structure of galaxies is that the size of galaxies, you know how galaxies have this wonderful spiral shape? Well, they're spinning. And we can judge by the spin that anything spinning with that much mass at that speed, the matter ought to be flying apart. It ought to be moving away from the center, but it's not. It's holding a, an integral shape. Well, what's, hold, what's keeping it there? Well, matter, would, that would make sense if there were matter that was exhibiting gra gravitational force. And so that's the postulate. That's dark energy, um, dark matter. Dark matter is matter that needs to be there in order to explain uh, what appears to be the operation of gravity uh, on things we can see, but we don't know what that, what that matter is. So that's dark matter. Dark energy is a little bit more interesting in some ways because it's, it's even a more recent discovery. In 1999, people began to realize as measurements began to get uh, finer, that the universe is not only expanding, it's expanding at a quicker pace. Well, this is really weird because ordinarily an initial energy will not, inertia will, will, will have a, a property, you know, friction and so forth, things will coast, slow down. For a long time, people thought, Perhaps the universe would be like a rubber band. It would expand, then it would contract, and perhaps it would keep doing this. But if the universe is actually expanding at a quicker rate, then uh, it's not going to do that. Well, how come it's expanding at a quicker rate? It's because of I haven't got a clue energy. <laughs> I haven't got a clue energy is pushing the universe apart. And uh, now, of course, again, very, very smart people have ideas as to what it could be. One possibility is simply that space, per se, has an intrinsic energy. We, don't, we think of empty space as being empty and therefore not having any potency whatsoever. But the thought is, perhaps, empty space is really not uh, has a energy that is intrinsic to space. This was actually, interestingly enough, an old idea from previous centuries that Einstein for a time entertained and then rejected and said it was his biggest blunder. He ever embraced it. He shouldn't have. Well, people are now calling it back in. Maybe Einstein wasn't wrong. The, uh, the idea of an intrinsic energy to space would account for how come as the universe gets bigger, there's more space Hence, the energy would be bigger. Hence, it would expand at an ever-increasing rate. And that is, as far as I can tell, the most common view among physicists these days. This is, that it's an intrinsic property of, of space. It's certainly being investigated. There is one problem with that particular theory. Um, based on the sort of calculations that um, they can do, estimating how strong this force should be given how much space there is. The cosmological constant, that's another word that they use for it, um, would be when they do the calculations to what they think it should be, it ends up being bigger than what it actually is by a magnitude of 120, 10 to the 120th.
their calculations of what it should be. So put it another way, the force exists, but it is a hundred, it is a negative hundred and twentieth weaker than it should be. We'll talk about that in a second, too. How you can possibly get anything larger or closer to what it should be would mean that the universe flew apart at such a sudden way that, it, that there would be no possibility of there being structures like galaxies and stars. But for some reason that nobody seems to quite have a... Re, the, 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 the force is much less than that. Well, um, the, the, so I just love it, you know, that 90, as, as science advances and, and science discusses more, what we really discover is how little we know. That 96% um, of the universe is, is you know, we, a big question mark. Um, but another funny thing has been happening in the, in, as, as this has gone on. And this is already beginning to give us uh, a flavor of it. The more we come to understand our universe with the precision, the wonderful precision that cosmologists are now doing, having, the more we're forced to say that this universe appears to have been fine-tuned in order, or let me put it differently, given the fact that this universe exists with galaxies and planets and stable structures like the Earth, which have been here for five billion years, the, the properties of the physical laws that we understand would need to have been fine-tuned to permit uh, a universe of this kind fine-tuned to a mind-boggling degree. And we cannot give any good reason for why the universe exhibits these fine-tuned qualities that seem to be uh, tuned as though somebody had had, you know, we'll just take an arbitrary number, 20 dials, each of which could be set at a fantastic needed to be fat, set at a fantastically fine tolerance. If you deviate even the slightest, you will set the re ratio of protons to neutrons, of gravity to the electromagnetic force uh, in such a way that the formation of galaxies and so forth would be impossible. And it, property after property has been fine-tuned to a mind-boggling degree. Um, well, uh, I'll get, I'm, I'm going to give you some examples here in a minute, but just to start giving you an idea of the sort of fine-tuning that we're talking about. Um, it, it's a little bit like, you know, most of the dial is, uh, you remember Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It's, it's too hot or it's too cold, or it's just, just right. And the just right part of the dial is, is very, very, um, is very narrow. Uh, let's take, let's go back to a point we, we measured early, or mentioned earlier. Big Bang. Big Bang distributes energy and mass uniformly. That's how come the cosmic mi microwave background is, is very, very even. Ah, but let's say that the Big Bang had been distributed energy and matter exactly evenly, perfectly evenly then every single particle in the universe would be moving away from every other single particle. You follow me? Because if it were exactly even, then everything would be moving away from everything else. And gravity would never be able to do its magnificent work of pulling things together into structures. So it has to be even, but it can't be too even. 
Because we've got to be able to have some bits of energy and matter pull together in order to form galaxies and stars in order to have the production of elements in life. Okay, but if things are too uneven, then matter and energy clumps together too much, and instead of having galaxies that distribute it over large uh, spans and can have long lifespans, you just get a universe filled with a handful of huge, massive black holes. So you've got to have a, an, an initial explosion that distributes energy and matter evenly, but not too evenly, in order to create ripples in the universe that become the structure of galaxies and galaxy families and so forth and so on. It's like the chocolate in your Rocky Road ice cream. It's, it's got to be there, and it's, if it's everywhere, then you got chocolate ice cream. Um, but you want Rocky Road, you just want the ripples. And uh, that's what we've got, a we've got a Rocky Road universe. Where the, well, what is the fine tune? What tolerance do you suppose was necessary in order to get the distribution not too regular? Not well, the back of the envelope thing that they say is, is one in a hundred thousand. So the fine tuning there, if it had been, um, if it had been uh, off by the measure of one in a hundred thousand, then the universe would either be too fine to create the structures that we have, or the structures would be too massive. Now I start with that one because you all, you all can understand what a hundred thousand is. That's a nice human number. Um, yeah, uh, there was once upon a time when 100,000, you know, was, was the kind of money that governments paid attention to and things like that. Um, but uh, it's, still a, it's still a number that's respectable, we, what we can imagine it. Well, um, when we start talking about some of the other fine tunings, we're going to a whole different place where the degree of fine-tuning is um, uh, different. But, and I, I will go there in just a second, but let, give, let me give you another example of, of a kind of a, a more ordinary, homegrown fine-tuning that's uh, very important to he life here on Earth. Um, water. Uh, as we know, or so far as we know, life is, is dependent on water. M living things are, um, in large quantity, um, uh, consist of, of water, and um, uh, all living things that we know depend on it to some degree or live in it. Yet water has at least one extremely unusual feature to it. Uh, ordinarily, when things get hotter, what do they do? And when they get colder, they... Virtually everything that we know of, as it gets hotter, expands. There's one exception. Water. As water freezes, it actually expands. Now you would think, so what does that do? It means your ice cubes float, for one thing. Um, but more importantly, what it means is that when winter comes on planet Earth, the ice forms at the top of streams and lakes. And that's extremely important because it means that underneath the ice, life continues. Now if water contracted, Ice as it formed would become heavier than the surrounding body and it would sink. And water in, would, would form in a way that actually extinguished life beneath it. And this would happen year after year after year. And life would not develop. But because water expands, you've got a surface uh, and for um, the uh, habitats below, 
So that's another example of, of fine tuning from our ordinary experience. Well, let's take a look at some others. Let me... Have you put, pass those out. Just pass them out. Now, I, uh, have you all got, got those? Have they made their way into the back? Oh, are we? Okay, sorry about that. I, um, maybe some of you can share. Uh, so these, these are a number of different, if you were to have uh, three different um, physicists give us fine tunings, they might well, uh, uh, let me start a different place. Virtually every cosmologist that I am aware of today will admit that fine tuning is, an obj is a feature of the universe that is extremely striking. I know that you all have heard uh, speculation about multiverses and multiple universes. Um, one of the things that drives the whole speculation about multiverses and multiple universes is, is the fine-tuning of the universe that we're acquainted with. And we'll talk a little bit more about that connection. But uh, people were not speculating about multiverses um, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. What changed? Part of what's changed is overwhelming evidence about the fine-tuning of this universe, which seems to require some sort of explanation and uh, the postulate of multiple universes is one way of trying to account for the character of this universe. So we'll go there in a second. But let's, let's, um, let's just take one here. Ratio of the electromagnetic force to gravity. Um, the, uh, the basic forces of the universe um, a couple of them we, take, we don't know much about, or at least we don't experience on a day-to-day -day basis. The strong force is what holds atomic nuclei together. We didn't know the strong force existed 100 years ago. The weak force is what keeps um, electrons floating around atomic nuclei. Strong force and weak force are not forces that we interact with on an on everyday level. Um, they exist, but we don't, we don't have much uh, um, knowledge of them firsthand. Electromagnetism and gravity is different. Electromagnetism, we know when we're Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and we see the magnet pointing to magnetic north. Uh, the electricity that powers our dishwasher. The lightning that comes crashing down from the sky. Electromagnetism is, as, as we all know, an extremely powerful force. My daughter got uh, um, shocked for the first time pulling a plug out um, from the computer. She's nine years old, and she said, Daddy, it hurt. And I said, that's why we tell you not to pull those things. <laughs> tell your parents, and we'll pull them out. Um, so she's discovered that you have to take electromagnetism seriously. Well, we all take gravity seriously, too. But gravity is, compared to electromagnetism, a fantastically weak power. Now, you may say gravity's weak. Um, yes, compared to electromagnetism, gravity is extremely weak. If you get into an electric current and it really grabs you, you get tied into that current. You, you may not be able to put down the hairdryer 
And that's just, you know, what, 120 volts. And that's how come it's so dangerous. And that's just one little appliance. Now, it's fortunate you're here tonight because you are about to see one human being defeat the gravity of planet Earth. I am about to defeat the combined gravity of one whole planet. <laughs> now, granted, I did not defeat Earth's gravity for very long, but I did defeat it um, for almost a second. So think about it. All of the gravity of planet Earth working against me, and for one second, I was stronger than it. So that tells you that the power of gravity, and then compare that to the electric hair dryer. So the relationship of, of gravity is a, a very disproportionate. Okay. So we calculate that out. What exactly is the relative strength of electromagnetism to gravity? How much work do they do? Uh, well, a, a big difference, a big difference. But in order for the universe to exist with, that permits the sort of structures that we know of uh, with galaxies and light and so forth, the relationship of gravity and electromagnetism must be balanced. If gravity were a little bit stronger or a little bit weaker, or if electromagnetism were a little bit stronger or a little bit weaker, then uh, gravity would either be too weak to hold together the universe and permit electromagnetic reactions uh, to take place, or it would be too strong and everything would be basically one big black hole. How fine does that balance need to be? Okay, before we talked about a ratio of one in 100,000, it's calculated that this ratio is about 1 to 10 to the 40th. 10 to the 40th is 10 with 40 zeros after it. That is a number that is so big that we can't put our heads around it. Let me give you uh, an illustration of what 10 to the 40th would be like. Okay, 10 to the 40th. This is actually 10 to the 37th, but it's close enough. Yeah. Oh. We, 10 to the 37th. Okay, imagine a continent like North America. Cover the continent in dimes. Now take your pile of dimes and carry it all the way to the moon. Um, now, just to give you a point of comparison, if you take the national debt in dimes, it's about um, I think it's about a square mile or so, and it's about three or four feet in dimes. So, but now we're talking about a continent in dimes all the way to the moon. Now do that a billion times. Now take one of those dimes, don't peek, <laughs> paint it red, and hide it. Now, go find the red dime. That's 10 to the 37th. The, the total number of atoms in the visible universe is estimated to be about 10 to the 80th. That's a big number. But the tolerance that the cosmological constant needs to have in order that the universe not fly apart is estimated to be 10 to the 120th. That 
that's, that's, that's mind-boggling. So um, the, the fine-tuning of the universe is, to some, in, in some sense, becoming, among physicists, one of the oddest features of the universe. We've seen some odd things. The, thing, the, the Big Bang was odd. Uh, the, um, the discovery of dark energy, dark, dark matter is odd. But the increasing perception of the, the fine-tuned universe is uh, in, increasingly becoming one of the most striking and odd features of this world that we inhabit. Now, as people of faith, what, 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 do, what do we make of this? Does a fine-tuned universe uh, prove the existence of God? No, I, I don't think it does. Um, does a fine-tuned universe uh, prove the important things such as uh, the inherent dignity of every person? Does it prove uh, the notion that people are created in the image of God? Does it suggest to us that um, the things worth living for are uh, the uh, principles of the kingdom of God that Jesus Christ embodied and lived out? No, that, no they don't. Um, the the fine-tuned universe is a, is a fantastically amazing thing, but, but it doesn't prove any of that. Where would we learn those things? Well, I'm convinced we're going to learn them best from our fellow saints, from the book of Scripture. I do believe that there is a role of spiritual authority. And uh, um, we, we stand in need of uh, apostles and prophets and ultimately of a savior who can open our eyes to mysteries that go deeper even than these cosmological mysteries that we're, we're talking about. But a fine-tuned universe is consistent with the book of Scripture. It's consistent with it to a, a very remarkable degree. So that if one were ha had to ask, uh, is a fine-tuned universe more consistent with a God as described in the scriptures or more consistent with um, blind chance, then one would certainly have to say it's more consistent, it seems, with, with, with belief in God. So it doesn't prove it, uh, but it does seem to me to be um, what we can uh, look to as confirming something that we do find written in the scriptures, uh, namely, the heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, and yet their voice goes out throughout all the world, and, the wor and their words to the end of the earth. The heavens are telling the glory of God. Now that same psalm, Psalm 19, after we hear about the, uh, the heavens telling the glory of God, it takes our attention back to the law of the Lord. And uh, having praised the heavens and its witness, it, it speaks about God's law and says that God's law is uh, light to the blind and, 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 and so forth. So it's not a question of one or the other, but again, it's a question of um, the book of nature and the book of scripture um, uh, reinforcing each other. So uh, what I think we should take from it as, as Christians, as people of faith, as people who are seeking to understand the faith, is an eagerness to become better educated in both books. Not to fear an exploration of the world, to remember Augustine's warning, not to hold so tight to our interpretations that we make fools of ourselves by closing ourselves to the, the testimony of science, um, 
but uh, to, 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 to uh, turn to science with a certain confidence and hope that it can um, re reinforce the message of Scripture. At the same time, I think we should be bold to say to those who purport to claim the authority of science and suggest that it's disprove God, um, we should just reject that for the hokum it is. Um, it's hokum. Uh, science, that's not something science can do. And it's, it's mere scientism that claims that science has done that. So at that point, let me uh, stop and just invite you all to share thoughts or ask questions.